In front of me, I have the Arcam SA30 and the NAD M10 V2. And these are what you might call Futurefy, to borrow a phrase, streaming amplifiers that feature Dirac, Dirac Live room correction. So if you're looking for a streaming amplifier around this kind of price point that features Dirac, well then I think these are your two main choices, the two different products that you might be choosing between. So I wanted to find out once and for all, which one out of these two is the best or maybe which one is offering the best value. Because I think the value proposition is really very interesting here because at the time of making this video, September 2022, here in the UK, there was a really big price difference between these two. With the Arc MSA30 costing £1,899, the price has come down from £2,199 whereas the NAD M10 V2 costs £2,399. But then you'll also need to buy the Dirac 4 license for about another £85. So we are in about a £600 price difference between these two here. That's a very significant price difference. So is it worth it? Is the NAD M10 V2 worth £600 more than the Arcam SA30? Well, that's also something that I wanted to find out. Let's start with the Arcam SA30, maybe what I like and don't like about it. Well, definitely what I do like is what we are getting here for our money. Let's not, I think, underappreciate the value of these all-in-one type streaming amplifiers because we are getting almost a full hi-fi system built into one chassis for one Cost. And with the Arcam, we are getting a wired and wireless network music streamer that's room ready and supports Tidal Connect and Spotify Connect and AirPlay 2 and UPnP and Chromecast. And we are getting an ESS Pro Sabre DAC with MQA support, a Class G integrated amplifier. We are also getting a moving magnet and moving coil phono stage, a headphone amplifier, Dirac room correction, with a decent set of connections for feeding other analog and digital sources into the SA30, including EARC via HDMI, so connecting to your TV is easy. And you know what? I don't think we can really ask for much more than that in this type of product, in a streaming hi-fi amplifier, except of course we can because there are a couple of bits missing. I think one thing that's definitely missing with the Arcam is some modern design flair. I think, you know, it looks, the SA30 looks very rudimentary, which is kind of fine, but also, you know, a bit more design flair, I think wouldn't go amiss. But the build quality is very good, with one, one niggle, one exception. The buttons on the front, hopefully you can hear this if I can find one, They clunk in use, which is fine, but then you get like a resonance that happens, I think, through the, the, the heatsink vent that's at the front. Quickly do it again. Ah, it's far from the end of the world, but I don't think it, it's perfect. And then my next complaint is the screen. And this is an interesting one because there is nothing wrong with the screen, but I don't think it's modern enough for this type of product category anymore. But don't get me wrong, you can clearly see all of the information on this screen sat at 12 or so feet away. So it's very functional, but let's be real about it. It's quite a primitive screen when we compare it to its main current competition, the screen that's in the M10 V2. Because again, being honest, the M10 V2 screen is about a thousand times nicer. And it does make a difference and it does matter. And I think that is an indication of one clear defining difference between who I think NAD and maybe Arcam are targeting or thinking who will be their core key customer for these products. I think Arcam are assuming their key customers for the SA30 will be what I would class as, you know, experienced diehard audio files that have maybe been around the block 20 or so times. They may be existing or previous Arcam customers. So this design, this form factor of hi-fi amplifier is familiar to them and it's kind of what they expect and what they're used to. Well, as I think NAD are thinking of their customer base being much wider than that, thinking their customer base might be 
This could be that someone's very first ever hi-fi system, or maybe it's just someone's first ever NAD hi-fi system, and they are looking to make a different kind of impression on that customer. They're looking to make a product that looks and feels more like a smartphone, I think in terms of just the appearance and the way it all works. And the NAD has real modern style to its design, real modern thinking to how it looks. Even the illuminated NAD logo on the top is just very cool. And of course, the form factor being so small, it's going to appeal to many. The feature set of the M10 V2 is very similar to that in the SA30. So wired and wireless network music streaming, an ESS Pro Sabre DAC with MQA support, AirPlay 2, Spotify Connect, Tidal Connect, room ready, analog and digital inputs, including HDMI with EARC, Dirac Live, and Blue OS, which is a key difference feature that we will talk about shortly. And one other huge difference is the amplifiers in the M10 V2 are digital. They are Hypex Encore Class D modules, whereas the amplifiers in the Arkham SA30 are Arkham's Class G. So, you know, different letters, they are obviously different, completely different technologies. So at this point, I think this comparison's pretty evenly split. We have, you know, price in favor, price in favor of the Arkham SA30, design in favor of the NAD M10 V2, but the spec and, and feature list is pretty comparable across both of them. So what about interaction? The NAD's touchscreen is a much nicer experience or thing to use and visually nicer too, except touchscreen means fingerprints are inevitable. And I don't know about you, but I hate fingerprints on my hi-fi. I can hear you sitting at home saying, Terry, it's 2022. Who uses remote controls anymore? Tell us about the control apps. Well, for the Arcam, you have Harman's Music Life, which is a very simple, very straightforward, very functional, easy to use music control app. But it's maybe just a little bit basic and plain. And you can access your music easy enough. You can have music playing easy enough. You can access the main controls of the SA30 to change its volume, change its DAC filter sound mode. You can dim the display. You can change inputs. You can even put the unit into standby. And that is all fine and works well. But for me, the bit that is lacking is the easy building of a play cue, because you can choose from a set of defined options for what a finger press does. But the only way to be able to load a full album and then maybe a few individual tracks from other albums is to bring up the full menu every single time. And if there was just a button at the top that said add album to the queue next to where it says play album now, then I think that would make this whole user app experience that bit more slick. I also think being able to see your play cue while you're browsing other music would be better. So the Music Life app is more than okay, totally usable and gives a very decent experience and it plays gapless if that's important to you. But I definitely wouldn't say that it's class leading. But we have to consider here the fact that you may well use the Arkham SA30 with say Tidal Connect or Spotify Connect or Rune. Well then, if you are, then your user experience with using the SA30 will be consistent with what those apps offer you. So that is obviously a completely, totally different user experience with the Arcam. Blue OS, on the other hand, is more feature rich and more visually satisfying to use. And you can do a similar set of essential tasks, such as play music, build play cues. And I like how you can see your playlist while you're browsing other music, especially as I couldn't do this with the Music Life app. Beyond this, you can control all of the settings of the M10, such as tone controls, useful for some, such as 100% worth of front screen dimming control, dimming control for the illuminated logo on the top, and more. This all feels nice and feels modern to interact with. And I like the way the options are all presented in the app. It feels personal, customizable, and it's just always visually satisfying. And for me, having Blue S as part of the overall package, as part of what you're buying with the NAD, the M10 V2 is very appealing, and I think it actually forms quite a big part of the product, really, or the appeal of the product. But what if you're in the situation where you're going to use one of the Kinex 
Netflix, Tidal or Spotify Connect or maybe Rune, well then maybe in that situation you're paying extra for something, you're paying extra for that Blue OS within the M10 V2 that you're not going to be using. So you're then paying for something you're not using. And I know I'm reaching there, and I am reaching there, but you know I'm trying to you know, ascertain the value proposition difference between these two. One major defining difference is the NAD allows users to engage one or two subwoofers and select a crossover point, essentially sending just bass to your subwoofers and then high pass into the main speakers. So the M10 just powers the speakers for mid-range and treble. And this option is completely missing from the RCAM. Yes, you have pre-outs to connect line level to subwoofers, but there is no crossover options, so no high pass filter option. So the subwoofer crossover and high pass filter options within the M10 V2 could be great for some audio files, of course. But here is why I don't think it's the kind of game changing home run type feature difference set definitely the difference that it could be. That is because I think there's some really important features or things here that's not been implemented or are missing. And the big thing that's missing for me would be subwoofer level control and maybe also time delay control. Time delay would be so that I can really fine tune the bass, really integrate the bass as fine tuned as possible. But the level control I actually think would be even more important. Just think of the situation where you could actually adjust the subwoofer level and adjust the subwoofer level independently for the different inputs. So that means when you're watching a movie, say using the HDMI EARC, you could maybe have the subwoofer level set hotter for more bass. In movies you have for a bit more fun, and then maybe you want the bass to be a bit less for your Blue OS, for your music streaming, or for your turntable, or something like that. Or maybe you just want a late night movie or late night TV watching mode where the bass is set really low. And if we had subwoofer control, subwoofer level control, independent for the inputs, or maybe even just for different profiles, that would be the game changing difference, I think, and the game changing feature. Because of course we can adjust the subwoofer level on the subwoofer itself, but that's really not easy, especially if we've got a subwoofer with analog controls. So it's a shame, I think that feature would be better implemented and it would be really good actually to see that in the M10 V2. But let's not take away, we don't see any of that at all in the Arkham SA30 either, which is an interesting one because the product that the SA30 replaced, the SR250, it had all of those features that I've just mentioned. So it's an interesting choice that Arkham have not included that in the SA30. And I think in future for products like this, if they're given us subwoofer outputs, if they're given us crossovers for subwoofers, give us level controls as well. Now you can do, everything that I've just mentioned using Dirac. You could do it for both of these two products, but I don't think it's necessarily that obvious. I could do it because I'm a professional Dirac calibrator, but for an average person, I think they might struggle to use Dirac to do what I've just explained. But I am very pleased to report with both the Arcam and NAD, Dirac works flawlessly. The user experience is excellent with both, and I didn't see any real problems here for this review with both the units on the most current firmwares. One difference is the NAD has five memory slots for different Dirac profiles, whereas the Arcam only has three. If you know what you're doing with Dirac, then you probably only need one memory slot. Three is definitely enough, five is probably wasted in two. So you're probably starting to form a strong opinion now about one either of these as being maybe more suitable to you or your preference here. Maybe the NAD for its design, its lovely screen, maybe it's high pass filter option, maybe the RCAM for, maybe it's phono stage or maybe it's price. But we haven't spoken about the key thing here and that's sound quality because I think all the features, all the stylish design in the world, it stands for nothing if the products don't deliver the sonic goods. I'm sure you will agree with me there. And I've got to say the Arcam SA30 delivers a strong sonic performance for the money in some key areas. Its sound does change a fair bit depending on the DAC filter mode that is applied and appadizing is selected as default, but for me, it's a bit soft and squidgy sounding with less than perfect timing when music gets complex. I preferred linear fast because it's seemingly the mode with the best timing where the sound cuts through best for transients, but you do lose a little warmth to the sound as a trade-off. And the SA30 in this DAC mode sounds lively, still just on the warmer side of neutral, with a decent amount of bass drive and authority. 
The soundstage is tall and quite wide and can be three dimensional depending on the music. And I think vocals are also very good for size with there being some emphasis on good tone and timbre which is always pleasing but it's still a little bit of a leaner sound than I think is ideal for vocals especially with the Mission speakers. But I could easily listen to the Arcan powering the Mission 770 without the need for a subwoofer. With the negatives of the SA30 sound being that the timing could be better still, definitely could be better still. I think the vocals, there's just a little bit of a metallic kind of sheen to the vocals and there is just some tension, there is kind of tension to its overall sound. But now engaging Dirac, the sound will depend on how good you are as a calibrator. It really is that simple. And I am a professional, so I could use Dirac to its full potential and make about as big a difference as is possible, even though the missions measure very good in my room in the main. And Dirac did what it does. So the timing soundstage and clarity was improved. With me doing what I do, I better tonally saturated the sound, especially for vocals, added more bass presence for a warmer overall balance and tightened the whole sound up from top to bottom. And with Dirac Engage, there was still some of the shorter comings of the Arcam SA30 to the sound. So still that kind of metallic kind of sheen that is on the vocals and still the tension in the sound. But with Dirac Engaged and everything that I did with it, it created a much nicer, more balanced overall sound. So I could then listen for longer periods of time, actually louder as well, with much less fatigue. A huge surprise to me was the built-in moving magnet phono stage because it delivered a very similar standard of sound compared to streaming digital, and it provided a really good amount of gain to the signal. So the music from vinyl sounded about the same volume as streaming digital, with the amplifier being at the same overall volume level. And the signal was really rather quiet for noise floor, and pops and crackles seemed more suppressed than I am used to. And I could use my Dirac calibration for the phono stage and for listening to vinyl. And I know this is not something that everyone would want to do, but I did my testing between using my Dirac calibration and using the Arcam in its direct mode, which is bypassing all of the digital circuitry. And I think in direct mode, the sound was slightly cleaner, but with my calibration, the system sounded better balanced overall. So how did the M10 V2 stack up for sound quality against a pretty solid in every area SA30? <laughs> extremely well. And the first thing I noticed is it sounds cleaner and clearer in every regard compared to the Arcam, starting with the blackness of the background. So the soundstage is more open with more defined space between the instruments or musical elements. But I think most people would notice the improved rendering of the musical images, especially the vocals. They are more in focus and you can hear more inner details of music because there is more control and resolution to everything. And I noticed this most with treble because it's presented more clearly and better resolved. Symbols just sound more detailed and seem to extend up more in frequency with more information. And it's not brighter, it's definitely not brighter. It's just clearer, or more well-defined, more well-resolved treble information, the fullness, the fullness of frequency of the treble information. But there is maybe just a little bit of digital sheen, glare, a little bit with the treble, but I am being ultra, <laughs> ultra critical there. And vocals also have more tonality and fullness compared to the SA30 and sound more like a mouth singing into a microphone because again, they are more focused and more clearly resolved. And the soundstage is also more dramatic compared to the Arcam. You are more aware of the difference in some music sounding more forward into the room and other music sounding deep, like you're listening to instruments in a space. So I think the M10 is just resolving, it's more transparent and more honest to the music. And the bass is also extremely impressive for being tight, controlled, really quite punchy and fast. Bass is really fantastic for being presented as bass notes or bass samples in space happening in front of you. These bass notes forming in the soundstage in front of you with real control, real kind of tautness, quite a bit of impact as well. And it's really damn impressive, really damn impressive to have that bass presence, but also the control and resolution of it from this package, from the price and from this size of package, really very impressive. And I think that 
aspect to the M10 V2, that control, the resolution, the way everything is organized around the soundstage is its big strength, its big sonic characteristic, the thing that stands out actually the most. But if I was to be a little critical of this because it's so clear, well resolved, and maybe technically very good, it's maybe just a little bit dry, but again, <laughs> that's real nitpicking, but it's important to nitpick because the price difference is so big. But let's be honest about it, you know, the M10 is a little bit drier sounding, but still less dry sounding than the Arc MSA30. But it's not all gravy with the M10 V2. I did find it to sound a little reserved at lower volumes with the Mission 770. I can hear it's always favoring composure and control over excitement. But when you get the volume up, for me it was around 65 to 70, it's a different story. The M10 now sounded much more exciting and alive. And it's a fine line sometimes for composure, but even at the this volume, the M10's composure stays intact with the benefits of just having a larger soundstage with it being bigger and more expansive. But I do think that maybe more power still would be a good thing. And then it was time to engage Dirac. And I'll be honest, I could have quite happily and listened without it until after, of course, because once I'd engaged Dirac, Dirac had done what it, it does and I'd done what I do. <laughs> then things really went up several, several notches. Because with Dirac enabled, the M10 was able to create an amazing overall sound. Richer, bolder, more dynamic, more lively, with even more scale and perceived dynamics. Coupled with musical images or instruments that now have a nicer, more rounded edge to them. And the treble was now smooth, and that sheen that I mentioned to the treble was gone and that dryness I mentioned before was totally gone. Now I feel like this was me truly hearing, truly hearing what the M10 V2 is capable of. And wow, what a cracking, really, really cracky sounding unit. Excellent in every single area. And that control and composure, when it's mixed with a more bold and rich sound, really is an enjoyable overall sound. And I think I could have sat 100 different audio files in this listening room, blind, blind listened or blind tested the system to them and they would have swore blind they was listening to a, a much more expensive system than, than the missions obviously with the M10 V2 which is about the highest praise that I can give to it obviously it's not totally perfect of course but wow for the money for the size it really can deliver the sonic goods I think it's the perfect time to wrap up this comparison review and answer the three important main questions. The first one being, is the M10 V2 worth 600 pounds more than the Arkham SA30? And I can very easily say, yes it is, yes it is. I think the package, everything that's rolled into it, what you get, how it looks, how you interact with it, the remote control, the app, and the sound quality is definitely worth the 600 pounds more than the Arkham SA30, which actually answers the second question. You know, the N NAD M10 V2 is the better, it is the best streaming Dirac Future Fire amplifier of the two. But what about the third question for best value? Does that mean the, Art, the NAD automatically wins that as well? Well, actually, no, not at all, actually. I, uh, value proposition-wise, I actually feel like the Arkham could offer better value because 600 pounds is still 600 pounds. It's still like a quarter or so of the price. And I think to fully appreciate the sonic differences between these two, I think an audio file would need to have very good speakers set up very well in a room with fairly good acoustics. And if that's not the situation, I feel like, you know, the sonic differences between these two could get squashed or could get kind of blurred a little bit whereby there is still a difference there but maybe a difference that some audio files would call diminishing returns as a difference. So then the features of the Arcam, the phono stage and the bits that the Arcam offers while keeping 600 pounds still in your pocket could easily make it the better value proposition here, could quite easily make it the better value. But I've got to say if it was my money and I was looking to buy a streaming Dirac FutureFi amplifier to pair with emissions, then I would spend the extra on the M10 V2. I really would, given my situation, because of what my preferences are, where my, where, <laughs> it ticks the important boxes for me. But I could fully see the Arc MSA30 ticking different important boxes for someone else, most notably being price. But I do think from the two, 
Yes, it's more expensive, but I do think it is a cut above the Arkham in a lot of really important key areas. So that's where I'm gonna finish the review. I hope you found it useful, interesting, and if you enjoyed it, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. And if you'd like to see you know, more comparisons like this and other hi-fi reviews, make sure you subscribe to the Pursuit of Perfect System YouTube channel. And I hope you've enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching all the way to the end, and I'll see you soon. Take care, bye.